if you're as old as me, you may remember Saturday morning pictures. Do you remember that? They call it the movies now. When I say to my grandkids, I go into the pictures, they say, what's that? Um, and I don't know if you were around in those days, but uh, we went to the cinema called the Rialto, and they had their own song, the Rialto Grenadiers. So we'd go there and we'd pay our 50p or whatever it was, and we'd, we'd see one of these films. And it always ended up with the hero just about to get crushed by a 20-ton block of concrete or something, and then the music would go up in a crescendo, and they'd go, da, 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 da. And, and you couldn't see how he was going to get out of that, but he said, come next week for the next instalment of da 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 to see how our hero escapes. So you'd go back again, and he always escaped. I don't know how he did, but he always did. And um, so I wanted to speak a little bit uh, this morning about heroes uh, of the faith. And um, it's lovely, isn't it, when God confirms what, what you're going to speak about. And uh, I, I went into the office this morning just to have a chat with Alan, and I, I never usually go in there. Um, but there was, there was that in the corner. And, um, and I thought, oh, that's lovely. And it was just as if the Lord said, yeah, this is what you're supposed to speak about this morning, heroes of the faith. So I'm going to take a picture of that later on. Uh, and there's some lovely people there, aren't there, from the Bible who we can um, look at and no doubt we have looked at over the years. Um, now I'm going to start off by reading the few verses from Hebrews 11, which uh, you wouldn't be surprised about, but I'm not going to speak from Hebrews 11, I'm going to speak from a passage in uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, but let's just turn to Hebrews 11, because it's, well, it's a lovely passage, and I think what happens is that we... We read the first few verses um, about faith and we read the characters, but I'm not sure we always read the last part of Hebrews 11. And I'll start uh, from verse uh, 35, Hebrews 11. It said, Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. And this is the lovely bit, and I, I, these words are wonderful. The world was not worthy of them. Isn't that amazing that when we go through difficulties and persecutions, the world's not worthy? And we don't want to be worthy in the world's eyes anyway, do we? We only be worthy in his eyes. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in caves and holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. What a wonderful reminder about um, heroes of the faith. So with that in mind, if you could uh, turn to uh, 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel, and we're in chapter... Uh, 14, 1 Samuel 14. It's about uh, Jonathan and his armour bearer. I don't know whether it's a story that you're very familiar with or whether you've preached on it, on it or listened to sermons on it, but I'm going to read some verses. 1 Samuel 14. One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to the young man, bearing his armour, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phinehas. 
the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. Verse 4, on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistines' outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes and the other Sinai. One cliff stood to the north towards Michmash, the other to the south towards Gebal. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, Come then, we will cross over towards the men and let them see us. If they say to us, Wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, we will climb up, because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes they were hiding in. And the men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armour bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armour bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armour bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armour bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armour bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. It's funny how the Bible puts in these little <laughs> bits and detailed bits, um, but it's, uh, it, it gives us a perspective of how that two people can put to flight 20, can kill 20, uh, but with God's help. And um, for my birthday, which was in November, uh, some of you, or most of you, weren't aware of that, so if you still want to buy me a present, that's fine. Uh, it's not too late. Uh, November the 9th it was, uh, just to let you know. And, um, but somebody bought me this book, Heroes of the Faith. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And um, it's got a list of, of so many heroes uh, of the faith. I don't know whether you've got a hero of the faith. Anybody got a hero of the faith? Yeah? Yeah, Nick, what's it, one of your heroes? Jesus, okay. Well, 10 out of 10 for that. Right answer. Anyone else got a hero of the faith? No? No? I'm sure you have, but you don't want to say. But uh, one of them here, there's, there's 50 of them in this book. And uh, you've heard of the lady, Corrie ten Boom, haven't you? Uh, that uh, Dutch lady who hid um, people, hid Jewish people uh, in the cupboard uh, at a false wall uh, in, in the war. And uh, eventually she was betrayed by somebody who pretended to need refuge. And uh, she was um, reported and all her family uh, were taken. And, um, well, they, they really suffered, didn't they? And most of her family uh, died. Uh, but she carried on, didn't she? And uh, did an amazing work. It says about her, she wrote a book called The Hiding Place, uh, within months, Corrie found herself associated with the resistance and she was uh, involved in risky schemes to obtain enough food in a time of rationing, a secret chamber, the physical hiding place of the book. So she was involved in risky schemes and that's something that I just want you to you know, think about, that element of risk. It has been estimated that with her family and neighbours, Corrie Ten Boom saved the lives of 800 Jewish people and other refugees. She was honoured in Israel by her work as one of the righteous among the nations. And that's an area outside of the Holocaust Museum where they remember those who are particularly uh, helpful towards uh, Jewish people. So one of the points I want to raise is that uh, to be a hero, uh, you need to be able to act alone. And it's all very well, isn't it? On a Sunday, we come together, we sing, we have a good time and we laugh and all that. Um, but that's a very, very small portion of our week, isn't it? And it's really significant that we take who we are and who Jesus is 
and we minister that to the people around us for the rest of the week when we're on our own because we're not surrounded by the covering of our, of our fellowship and songs and worship and praise and all that sort of thing. And in verse 1 and verse 3, it's very significant. And why does it mention it? I think it mentions it for this reason. In verse 1, it says, He did not tell his father he was going out. And then in verse 3, no one was aware that Jonathan had left. And what that says to me is that Jonathan goes out into a risky situation and he had no safety net. He couldn't call on his father. He couldn't call on uh, the army because nobody knew that he was there. And that really spoke to me as, as I was uh, preparing this. Um, there was no plan B. And, and I think very often, as, as a people, um, and you can ask yourself this question, how safe do I play in my Christian life? How safe uh, am I? What surrounds me? What do I put around me to make my life and my witness safe so that I'm not exposed? And interestingly enough, in verse 8, uh, and verse 11, this is the theme of being exposed. Jonathan and his armour-bearer, he comes to the enemy and he says to his armour-bearer, let's cross over towards the men and let them see us. Let the enemy see us. And a bit later on in verse 11, so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Do you get the picture that to be someone who is going to make a dent or a big hole uh, in the enemy's armory has got to be someone who is not hiding, but someone who is prepared to reveal themselves. Someone who is prepared to be seen, someone who is prepared to be vulnerable and to take that risk. And when I was looking up the, the Hebrew word, as some of you will know when you come to the beauty and the power of the Hebrew scriptures on a Wednesday, um, the word where it says, show yourself, let them see us, it means to uncover a secret, uh, to be bare, like if you've got a bald head. So, you know, if the cat fits, wear it. If you've got a bald head, then that's very, very scriptural uh, because that's what the Hebrew word means. Um, to pull back a veil also to advertise. Now that to me isn't a description of most of the Christians that I've met in my life. Most of the people that I've met in my life are very, very prepared to hide, uh, not to be seen. You know, I'm humble, I'm shy, I'm timid, I'm this, that and the other. And there's this great sense of hiddenness going on. Well, when I was standing at, at the door this morning, uh, I was saying hello to some people and um, I spoke to this uh, amazing person uh, called Mark. Uh, there he is, there's Mark, you all know Mark and Donna. And I was chatting to Mark and I said, Mark, are you up for anything? And he went, well, yeah, like that, you know. And I said, like, if I said for you to do something now, what would you say? He went, yeah, like that. Well, not quite like that, but you know what I mean. And he said, oh, I'll pray about it and I'll, you know, give myself space and all that. So I said, what would happen if I asked you to say something this morning during my, te during my message? And he went, yeah, no, not quite. But he said, yes. And I said, Mark, you're such a blessing. So, Mark, at this point, I'm going to ask you to come up because Mark didn't know this was going to happen and I caught him on the hoof and all the rest of it. And I know most of you like that, don't you? You like to be put on the spot, don't you? Hands up if you like to be put on the spot. No, uh, no. Hands down if you like to be put on the spot. <laughs> so God bless you, Mark. You have a little, a little chat. Go okay. on. Go on. Uh, is that okay? Am I speak, speaking okay in the mic? Um, yeah, it was, uh, I think, what Alan said about being vulnerable and uh, putting yourself on the line is very, very true because it's so easy to come into church, to be with people, and to listen to the word, and to not say a lot. And I don't say a lot, 
when I come into church. I fully acknowledge that. But does that, not, does that mean that I'm not thinking about God? Does that not mean I'm taking, not taking stuff in? It doesn't mean that at all. Um, but like Alan said, you know, we can prepare and manage our week and, uh, um, and we can make sure we're safe as we, as we go along the way. And to put a finer point on it, there's been a lot of times, especially in the past and in the present as well, where my faith has been shakeable. And I fully acknowledge that. I, I don't think there's a person in this room who can honestly and truthfully turn around and say their faith hasn't been shakeable. Because it, it has to me. But then again, I'll come back to the stuff of life, which is breathing. Because God breathed life into me. And he created the universe and he created us for a reason. And it's remarkable when you think about God in his plan of creating the universe, that he had me in mind and he had every one of us in mind at the start of creation. And it kind of like blows me away a little bit. But, you know, this time, there's obviously been a lot of times when my, shake, my faith has been shakeable in the past. And I've gone through some stuff. And by no means am I saying my stuff's any worse than anybody else's in this room. It's just different. Um, and... Um, but whenever I get to a point where my faith is shakeable, I'm reminded about God sending his son to die for me. And that just blows me away every time I think about it. It blows me away. And it gets me back to a, a centre where I'm focusing on God's kingdom. And of course, you know, the sword of the spirit, the word of the God, word of God, being dressed in the full armour of God is really, really important. And reading scripture, I, I can only encourage you in the same way everybody else would encourage you about reading scripture every day. Could I do more for God? Absolutely. Do I do more for God? Not enough as far as I'm concerned. But he's not a God of condemnation. God is a God of love. And his love gives us perfect peace. And so whenever I think and listen to these inner critical voices of the enemy, because there are a lot of inner critical voices, and I work with people day in, day out, who've got this inner critical voice that's telling them they're no good, that's telling them they don't know what to do with themselves, that they're not a good person. I dress myself in the full armour of God because I know that that inner critical voice is coming from the enemy. So when that comes, just at that point, I focus back on the kingdom of God, I focus back on the fact that God so loved the, the world that he sent his son to die for me. And that blows me away. When I get back into that place and I start to read scriptures, it just lifts, lifts me up. So in conclusion for me, God is everything for me. He's absolutely everything. And, you know, I, I'm just, although I, I, you know, everybody struggles on this earth, I struggle on this earth to kind of survive because that could, well, that's what life can be about sometimes survival and I know there's a lot going on in, out there in that dark world where people are trying to survive they're trying to survive particularly with fear fear is at the centre of their persona because it paralyses them but when you come to God when you give your life to God and I know I, I can remember my testimony like it was yesterday when I, gave my, when I gave my life to God, my heart was transformed. And I was having a conversation with somebody um, on Zoom this week about that. And he was expressing that he was concerned about his relationship with God. And I said, look, the only thing I can say to you is that it was a complete transformation of the heart. And I realised that because he sent his son to die for me. And when that, when that realisation came into my spirit, everything changed. And the burden and the weight that I had on my shoulders trying to find a sense of belonging in the world was lifted because I suddenly realised where my sense of belonging is and will be in eternity. And that's the great thing. Although it's a struggle on earth, although, although God will tell me when my time's come, I'm so looking forward to eternity like you wouldn't believe. So God is everything to me and... Um, 
you know, I'll continue to try and just make sure that that everything is at the focus and the centre of my life every day. Thank you. Let's give Mark a clap. Um, yeah, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> Let's pray for Mark. <laughs> Lord, thank you for the stories uh, that are written and etched in Mark's life, Lord, over his life. Lord, stories of when he first met you, uh, the stories since, Lord, of how you've provided, how you've come to his rescue, uh, how you've cleaned him and purified him and uh, given him, Lord, that sense that he can stand with confidence in the presence of God because of Jesus. So we bless you for him today. And we pray, Lord, that this week especially might be uh, a week of a double portion, of a double anointing, that you will anoint his mouth, his lips, Lord, so that, Lord, when he speaks, the word of God might really come forth in power. And so we bless you for him. Thank you that we've been enriched by listening to him this morning. We thank you for him, and we thank you for you working in him. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless amen. You, bless you, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Doesn't it do you good to hear people, uh, you know, and however much our weaknesses and however nervous and that we are, there is a sense of breaking through uh, because of him, because of this, which is what we're going to do um, at some point soon. Uh, there was a, a Welsh missionary uh, in the 1860s, and um, he went out to Korea. His name was Robert Germain Thomas. He was only 26. He'd only been married for two years, and... Um, he went out on a boat called the General Sherman uh, and they were going along the river and they were trying to reach the, the natives on, on shore. Uh, they were very, very hostile. Now they had the opportunity of turning round or changing course and going away because obviously their lives were in danger. And what happened is that the natives tried to get out to sea to attack them and all the rest of it and they couldn't. So they sent a fire ship uh, towards their ship and as the fire ship was approaching, some of them stayed on, on board the ship and therefore uh, were burned. Uh, others just jumped in the water and were drowned. Um, but him and a few others made it to the shore uh, where they were killed. And at the point where he was being attacked, he lifted up a Bible and, and gave it to the one who was attacking him and uh, so gave his life, he died, but he gave the word of God uh, to these people as he was dying. What an amazing thing to do. The last act on earth is to give the word of God to someone. Incredible. And um, a while later, what they found, that the, the, the pages of this Bible had been fixed on this person's hut, their home, like wallpaper. So as people went to his house, they were reading the word of God, which was on the wall. And the chief got saved, uh, and the tribe got saved, and the Holy Spirit just went through that place like wildfire. Isn't it amazing what God can do through an individual who says, it's not my life, but it's yours. And I'm going to take up my cross, and I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to face whatever the world or Satan throws at me. It actually doesn't matter what the world throws at, at you, does it? It really doesn't matter. You know, that Proverbs thing, 31, I can laugh at the days to come. I use that a lot for my own self and for other people. Does it really matter what tomorrow holds? Does it? When we're in Christ, when we're full of the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, we really, really, really don't have to worry about tomorrow, do we? If it's a test, we don't have to worry about it. If it's in the headmaster, we don't have to worry about it. If it's in the boss, we don't have to worry about it. If we're sick and others around us are sick, why do we worry about anything like that when it can't add anything? That's what Jesus said. So when we're a sort of people who are thinking, well, Lord, I want to be a hero for you, don't we? We want to be a hero for Jesus. What's wrong with that? Because what happens is that when we've learned to act alone or, as Jonathan found, 
Um, they were acting alone. They had nobody by, behind them to back them up. They can still experience the victory uh, because God is on their side. And uh, you look at verse 22. Very, very interesting uh, how you can be a hero because what a hero does is a hero inspires, don't they? You know, you get um, over the years, when Wimbledon comes up, which is sort of June, July time, the tennis courts are full of people playing tennis, aren't they? Because they see all these people playing tennis. They think, oh, I think I'll go and play tennis, you know? And, and you get, I mean, I've got, I've got grandchildren, probably you have too, and, and, and kids, and they're all wearing costumes, don't they? You know, whether it's Superman or Batman or uh, the Joker or whatever it is. I don't know what the latest is now. Super Mario, is it? I don't know. But whoever they are, they're inspired to go out and their parents have got to pay all this money uh, for a costume that they're going to throw away in six months and they're going to transfer up to another superhero. Uh, and as Nick said, we don't have to do that because we've got one superhero and there he stays. And that's wonderful. But you look at verse 22. And verse 22, is this symptomatic of you and your Christian life? When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined the battle in hot pursuit. So the Lord rescued Israel that day and the battle moved on beyond Beth Aven. So what's happening here is these people missed the fun all right, they weren't around for the battle. They were too busy hiding. But as soon as they realized that Philistines were running away, they were quite happy to run after them. But they didn't want to face them when the Philistines were coming. They waited until they were running away. I don't know if that rings a bell, perhaps with some, some of us. Are we like that? Are we hiding away like these people? Do we jump on the back? of someone else's victory. Saul was a bit like that. If you uh, turn back a, a, a couple of chapters in chapter 13, 1 Samuel 13, see, because Saul was insecure as a person, uh, because he wasn't, if you like, uh, following the Lord and following God's ways, this is the sort of thing that happens. People are insecure. You know, ministers can be insecure, quite jealous of their pulpit. They don't want anyone else to preach, just in case that person preaches better than they do. And I think, I've never felt that with Alan. Have you? Never felt that with Alan. Somebody who's willing to share his pulpit and bless others and lift them up and encourage them. And actually, what does it matter if somebody does something better than you anyway? It makes a difference, does it? Encourage them. God bless them. So what happens, what's in Saul's heart is that um, in verse 3, it says, Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Gibar, and the Philistines heard it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news, Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost. Well, it doesn't say that earlier on, does it? It says that Jonathan attacked the outpost in verse 3. So read that. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost. But in verse 4, Saul twists it to make it sound as if he attacked the Philistine outpost. And the thing is, is we get nowhere if we borrow somebody else's spirituality. We get nowhere if we hide behind the label of a church. How many people say, oh, I go to this church. Oh, Really? Oh, must be good there. Oh, it's amazing, the worship, oh, oh, and all that. But where are they individually, spiritually? Years ago, I was leading a meeting, speaking at, at um, an Ichthus meeting. And uh, you may or may not know much about Ichthus, but they've been around 30, 40, 50 years, really. Uh, over a thousand, you know, together in their churches. And I was preaching, it. they were all Ichthus people, and I said, come forward if you, if you want ministry. Loads of people came forward. So I said to this lady, I said, what do you want prayer for? She said, well, I've been really struggling with my faith. And I thought, yeah, but you go to an Ichthus church. 
You've got Roger Forster as your leader. How can you, how can you struggle with your faith? Well, of course people struggle. It doesn't matter who your leader is, does it? doesn't matter what your church is called. We still struggle with things. So let's not hide behind the label of a church. Let's not hide behind someone else's testimony or someone else's spirituality. And, uh, and that's exactly what Saul did. He borrowed someone else's glory. And we don't need to do that because the Lord will deal with you in the way that he needs to deal with you and it will be different to the way he deals with other people. And just going back to 1 Samuel 14 again, very, very important and... uh, this is, this, is what, um, this is what Jonathan says. And he says, um, 1, Samuel, 1 Samuel, I've got 1 Samuel 14, 12. 1 Samuel 14, 12. And what he says uh, here, uh, no, he doesn't say that in 14, 12. But what he says, that's it, 14, 14 6. So Jonathan says to his young armor bearer, come, let's go to the outpost. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So as we face this new week, you can say to yourself, nothing, that means nothing. That means nothing. Doesn't it mean nothing? No plus no is nothing. No times no. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. And I really believe and I firmly believe, you know, that, that, that we can be overcomers in any and every situation that we face. That's not triumphalism where we, we are in denial about what's going on. It's not about that. We face the fact that we might be ill. We face the fact that we might be grieving. We face the fact that we're going through difficult times. But whilst we are facing those situations, we know that there's nothing that can stop the Lord from saving. And that's got to be a comfort to you, isn't it? It's got to be a comfort to me as we recognise that God is with us, God is in us, God is around us. There's nowhere that we can run. Jonah found that, didn't he? One of the things, one of the Hebrew thoughts in those days was they felt that God was locational. God was geographical. That you could have a God over there and a God over there and perhaps God's over there. That's why he ran away. He ran away because he thought he could run somewhere where God wouldn't be. But God was there. And God pursues us, doesn't he? Praise God. I'm glad he does. There was a lady called Virginia Hall in the World War II, and she was the most dangerous spy uh, that the Germans knew. And the incredible, incredible thing about her is she had a wooden leg. She had a hunting accident, and she literally shot herself in the foot. You know, we've used that phrase, haven't we? But she did shoot herself in the foot. And so her leg was amputated below the knee, and she called the wooden leg Cuthbert, so had a little, had a little name uh, for it. And the Germans nicknamed her the Limping Lady. And they did all they could to capture her, but they couldn't. So a lady couldn't walk properly, and yet she organised jailbreaks, sabotage missions, saved hundreds of people, uh, was instrumental in leaking information to the enemy. And uh, someone who was willing to risk their life. And isn't that what Jesus said? If you put your hand to the plough and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Take up your cross daily. We know these things, but I wonder really uh, whether we live them out. I don't know if you ever saw that poster years ago. It's probably still around. If you were convicted... Uh, no, if, if you were brought to a judge, something like that, would there be enough evidence to convict you as a Christian? 
or would there be no evidence because we're not doing anything? Would there? And, and only you can, can answer that. So, so I'd, I'd just like for a few minutes before... I'll lead straight into communion, shall I? Yeah. Just before we lead into communion, perhaps you can have a... We can have a few minutes of just, of just opening up our hearts to the Lord. I don't know whether you want to be a hero. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be a hero because there are people in the Bible, as we've said, they're heroes and they can inspire us. Lord, I want to be inspirational to somebody. Lord, I don't want guilt in my life to cancel me out. Lord, I don't want to disqualify myself because you have qualified me. Perhaps you can do a bit of uh, business with the Lord now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.